Armstrong. Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. Wave the flag proud and high, boys. Show them how we stand. Every shall it be champions, known throughout the land. Wheaties, breakfast of champions, bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy. The Columbia Network takes pleasure in bringing you Suspense. Suspense. Columbia's parade of outstanding thrillers, produced and directed by William Spear and scored by Bernard Herrmann. The notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio. The Amos and Andy Show. If you believe that the age of miracles is past, well, you're in for a jolt. Andy has just told his friends, Amos, the Kingfish, and Van Porter, that he's finally decided, after many bitter experiences, that women no longer have a place in his life. <laughs> Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? <laughs> The shadow knows. The Green Hornet. He hunts the biggest of all game, public enemies that even the G-men cannot reach. The Green Hornet. And now, Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. A cloud of dust and a hearty high o silver, the Lone Ranger. Let me tell you something, Jasper. We got all these great radios, but the problem is. If you have one and you turn it on, there's nothing to listen to. Well, the picture's a lot brighter than uh, anything else. You get a clear picture. What does that mean?
year. Oh, we go to 10, 15,000 a year. Now, how'd you get into the fruit basket business? I started this fruit basket business 50 years ago when nobody knew what a fruit basket was. What kind of people get fruit baskets? Well, they thought that you only sold fruit baskets around the holidays. I've proved them different. You sell fruit baskets every day. How Hospitals. Much, how much would a fruit basket like that cost? We got them anywhere from $25 to $200. Wow, this is $200. one order. This is one order going to the Adams Mark Hotel for a jewelry convention. We're here at Jasper's Radio Museum on Cherokee Street in Antique Row, and we're with Mr. Jasper Jardina. Mr. Jasper Jardina. Okay, Jasper. How long have you had this store? I've had the store about 20 years, collecting radios for over 40 years. How many radios do you have? I have over 10,000 radios. 10,000 radios. And like, how much is the most expensive one worth? Oh, we're talking ten to $15,000. There's a ten to $15,000 radio here? I know, not here, but it's close by. Oh, you don't keep it here? No. <laughs> well, what made you start a radio museum? Well, I was in the antique business, and uh, I start collecting furniture and whatnot and everything, and I just got too big with, uh, with everything and I figured something had to go and I got to specialize in something so I chose to stay with the radios. And um, this is two floors and it goes all over the place you here. Two, you got eight rooms and two floors up and down. You got the basement and everything. Every There's every, more radios in the basement? Every inch there's a radio. Wow, there's a I lot of radios. Live, I used to live upstairs until the radios knocked me out. I had to move. I filled the upstairs and had to leave my apartment upstairs and put radios there. I imagine you own this building? I own the building, yes, sir. Wow. Well, um, what is like some of the weirdest radios you have? Well, they come in all different sizes and shapes. There's novelty radios, there's uh, old time regular mom and pop radios, the old floor model radio, and just about any anything that. Uh, <laughs> that they make is can be made into a radio. I hear there's a new one out that uh, it has a bottle of perfume with it. It's a ceramic and it has a, has a radio on it. I gotta go and hunt that up to see if, I gotta run that down to see if it's true or not. Now you are still buying radios? Every day. A day don't go by that I don't buy radios. And I imagine people come here from all over the country to all buy over, radios? All over the world. Holland, I got my guest book there. People from Holland, from Italy, from Germany, all over the world. I'm known up and down the West Coast better than I am known in St. Louis. This is the biggest radio museum in the world? Radio, biggest collection in the world. Nobody can come near it. And I understand you said that Jay Leno was here buying radios? Jay Leno was here. He has, uh, he's interested in car radios. He collects antique cars, and uh, I have some old antique car radios. Let me ask you something. What is this gas pump doing here? This was just something that I had. I bought in a package deal. The man had a whole truckload of radios, and this was happened to be the odd piece that was on a truck. And I just told him, just drop it there, and I'll see what I can do with it. Well, what can you do with it? I don't know. Some people put it out on their, if they got a farm, they put it on their driveway by the end of the, where the house sits or something. There, there is a use for them. They do use them. I guess to pump gas. No, they put a mailbox on them or put a light on them. Use it for a decorative piece. Now, I look at all these radios here, an incredible collection of radios. The thing that I, I say to myself is, there's so many radios, there's thousands and thousands of radios here. But if you had one of these radios and you took it home and turned it on, there's so little to listen to on the radio. No, there's plenty to listen to on the radio. I listen to the radio all the time, 24 hours a day. And I have, uh, I also have a 52-inch television, but I only use that in sporting events. I'm, I'm a radio person. Yeah, but radio is nothing compared to, uh, to the way it used to be. 
Well, uh, sure it is. Uh, there, there's one thing you can move the dial. You can get music if you want music. You can get talk radio if you want talk radio. There's, there's so many different things with radio. There's the commercials are better. They're even clearer on radio. I imagine that a radio with a lot of tubes would be a lot better than a radio with less tubes. Oh well, yeah, there are some more powerful radio. The sound is better, and uh, all your uh, all your music, your music is really. You know, it's all in detail. You can hear all the drums and the, every instrument that's playing. Now, generally, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s, people had radios, and because of radio broadcasting at the time, people could listen to faraway stations easier. Well, that's what I'm talking about, the antenna. They had an antenna from the house, and they used to run it out their window to a tree and hang it up at a tree sometime, and then get in the house and play with the radio and see how far they could get. Here's a, here's a Stuart Warner radio made in 1929. This is what they call a parlor radio. It's run by batteries. There's a speaker. It also has a little portable bar here slides in and out and you have your your gauges for your power it's called a Stuart Warner 1929 they're all grandfather clock radios they have clocks on I uh, I kind of like radios with clocks in them there's what they call a grandmother clock a grandmother clock is a little shorter than a grandfather clock that's a short one, that's a grandmother clock, and there you have the rest are all grandfather clock radios. This here is a parlor radio, it's all hand carved. It's called a Roosevelt. This is 1929, very ornate. All hand carved, no composition wood. This is an early battery set. It uh, looks similar to a cable radio. Your three dials are on the top here where you, all three numbers on the dials have to match in order to get into a station. But on the inside you have your, uh, all your mechanism, here's your speaker. Then you have your WD-11 tubes, which are about $80 a piece today. Mm -hmm. And these are your power tubes in the back, your great big tubes in there. But that is, uh, that is just how they uh, all uh, went into radios. Everybody wanted something different. Show us that the radio behind you looks like books. Yeah, this is a book radio. That there looks like a set of books. <laughs> up. Wow. That's amazing. There's radios in every shape, color, or form. That's a Philco, that's a mantle clock radio. How much would a radio like that be worth? Oh, I'd say 500 to 600. But everything is all intact, you know. You don't have a busted top or all chopped up, everything everything I have is pretty well intact. It's amazing the stuff you have here. Here's another early battery set. This took the great big car battery. They oh, stored them. I could agree. <laughs> they stored them under here. When the farmer was done plowing the ground, he'd come in, put the battery in here and hook up the radio. <laughs> there's the dials and here's the speaker. Wow. Now most of the farms didn't have, I mean, almost all the farms didn't have electricity back then. No, this is just what I say. He, he was out plowing the field, he had a big battery, put it in there and hooked up the radio. See, here's another nice radio. This is called, this is called a Kennedy. See how, how competitive it was in them days? <laughs> That's called a Kennedy. And look at, look at the, look at the woodwork on that there. Radio was really competitive in them days. Now, all these radios had to have an, an external antenna, right? Oh, yeah. They still do today. If I, that's a small Zenith, a little small Zenith table radio. That's from the 40s. See, these, air, these radios tell you what era they're from. 
Uh, they got away from the great big radios, from big floor models, and they had these here. Then the 40s, they come into this. Then the late 40s, they come with the bank of light. You know, nobody wanted the heavy things. Well, these are uh, Edison record uh, uh, record players. They're the, with the, with the uh, cylinder record. Right? Remember, that this is the cylinder record they play. Some, some have a one-minute uh, cylinder, and some have a two-minute cylinder. And the horn, uh, the horn goes here. The <laughs> tripod that holds the horn on. Gee. What's amazing is the different size horn, how much This is what they call a tulip, uh -huh. a tulip horn. Then you have the brass horn. You have the all brass horn. Here, this thing's wrong. How's that thing wrong? Turn it on. Can I play something? Do so good? Yeah, it's fine. Turn it on, you just turn it off. Put the horn on first. Oh, it's got to crank it up first. Get your back in or something, buddy. having you coming down to take a picture of my radio museum. I really don't do this for the money. I love it and I love, I know love the fun with it. Listen, Jasper, I'm going to tell you something. That you are performing a great service by having this radio museum and by preserving something that nobody else is. I think this is probably unique in the whole world. Well, that's my goal, just like I say, to pass it on to my daughter and my grandkids and have it here for somebody to enjoy anytime they want. People come in here and they troubleshoot and they look for tubes and they look for parts. If I got them, they're welcome to them. If they're, if they're restoring a the radio and I can help them, I'm glad to do it. When we were taping this story about Jasper's Radio Museum, there were people coming in all the time asking to buy different radios and Jasper wouldn't sell them to him. He is truly a man that is a collector that's preserving the past and I can't tell you how lucky we are to have this wonderful place in our town. Jasper's Radio Museum. Sam again. Steven, are you there? Yes, I ain't going nowhere. You got a visitor? A visitor? Oh, Sapphire, I knew you would come. I knew you wouldn't desert me. Oh, darling, darling, where is you, darling? Yeah, I is, darling. Oh, tell him. Five minutes. 
Okay. Hey, Kingfish, this is a nasty robbery rap they done pinned on you. Calhoun, you got to get me out of here. I am innocent, completely innocent. Innocent? Well, now, that's liable to slow me down a little. I ain't never had a client that is innocent before. Calhoun, <laughs> this is the worst mess I ever done been in. You were my lawyer. Yeah, well, things look bad. They got a lot of circumstantial evidence against you. But I was happy to tell you that I was getting you out of this mess. Calhoun, how are you going to do it? Never you mind. But when I put you on the stand tomorrow afternoon, we win the case. I've got everything in the bag. Kingfish, i got a foolproof scheme of how to get you out of this whole mess. When I make my point, the judge is going to throw the case right out of court. That's fine, Calhoun. That's fine. Okay. Hey, boy, come on, get me out of this thing. Calhoun, you're a great lawyer. A great lawyer, Calhoun. Uh, incidentally, I have arranged to have the opening of your trial delayed till tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock. As long as you're going to be in here, you may as well get as many free meals as you can. Uh, we'll see you later. Your Honor, as counsel for the defense, I emphatically deny the accusations of the prosecutor. I intend to prove that my client in an Allison's pawn shop for the most innocent of reasons, and that robbery was furthest from the mind of this innocent man. <laughs> Your Honor, as my first witness, I would like to call to the stand the defendant, George Kingfish Stevens. Step up there, bud. <laughs> Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help you? I do. <coughs> Your full name is George Kingfish Stevens? Uh, it is. At this point, Your Honor, I would like to show that my client had no intentions of committing a holdup. And I intend to prove that point beyond the slightest shadow of a doubt. Your Honor! When my client went into that pawn shop, he went in there with a gun that could not possibly be fired under any circumstance whatsoever. And right here and now, I intend to offer conclusive proof to that statement. Your Honor, you can pull the trigger of this revolver as much as you please, and it will not... Your Honor, I would like to ask the court's permission to resign from the case. Bailiff, remove the counselor for the defense from this courtroom. Extra, something extra. Posies for the girlfriend? Yes, sir. And an extra blossom armor to wear in his buttonhole. Everyone likes that little something extra. A dozen rolls and the baker tosses in an extra one to make it a baker's dozen. The butcher throws in an extra bone for the bow wow. Every locality has a different name for it. Way down east in New England, they call it something to boot. In the deep south, they call it lanyard. At your neighborhood service station, they call it Esso. The new Esso gives you premium performance, unexcelled at regular price. And the new Esso Extra is unexcelled at any price. Extra quick starts, extra power, extra anti-knock. You can take your choice. These two great gasolines are both extra value for the money. For service, that is tops. And gas that's extra fine. There's a smile for every mile at the S.O. sign. E-S-S-O makes your car go. Happy motoring.
What I always say is that the water from the St. Louis tap today was somebody's piss a few days ago because they keep recycling the same water over and over again in the Mississippi River. So I love to drink spring water. And Linda and Marty and me and some other people went to a beautiful spring in South Missouri and filled up our own jugs with spring water. This place is called Reed Spring and it's really beautiful. And the water's real good too. Seven jugs full of water. Yeah. Counting Linda, look at 89. <laughs> Ready to get popsy? Keep it up. We can water, Mom. Yeah, we got 87 jugs worth of water. With Linda, we got 89. And with you, we've got an old bucket. <laughs> This is Marty, and this is Worldwide Magazine. I'm at uh, Vince's uh, birthday party, and you know Vince is like, uh, how old is Vince now, Pete? Uh, like Pete, he's like 51. Is he 52, 53, 54? Who knows? Vince is in his 50s now. I think I think Vince is in his 50s. How old are you? 50, right? Yeah. Okay, you're 50. Pete's like 50 years old. Okay, well it's. Uh, Vince is like uh, real close to Pete's age, but uh, we're not talking about Pete, we're talking about Vince. We're here at um, Molly's uh, courtyard in the back of 1816, 816, 816 Geyer. 
is, is what I'm supposed to be saying. And as we're at Nyfigar, and uh, it was a real beautiful courtyard, and uh, Vince invited all these wonderful people. He invited uh, Gussie Bush the third. He bought the. He, he invited uh, Louis Mall the second down. He invited all these great people. He invited uh, Don Brown Jr. from Don Brown Chevrolet down. He invited uh, the, the big dealership of uh, Fred Weber, I forget what his name is, Mr. Olive. He, he, he invited a bunch of people. He invited the, the, the chairman of, of, of the credit union of Anheuser-Busch, the, the, the fire department. He, 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 he invited Neil Satanix, the fire, the fire chief of St. Louis. You know, he's invited very important people to come to his birthday party. So, on a serious note, you know, without Vince's birthday party, life is just another day. So Vince invited everybody here, which is his uh, taping this, it's on July 24th. It's a nice Friday night, it's uh, like 6.30 evening, it's real nice out. We're done with the heat wave for a couple days, so uh, I ain't blowing up no sweat like I was two days ago. So, um, what do you think, what do you think? You th what do you think? Uh, what what what's a, what's a July 24th mean to you? Maybe I ought to go out and ask p other people in the in the uh, courtyard out here about what does the 24th mean? Vince's birthday. Vince's birthday, right? Is uh, is it another day to you? Which uh, my answer is, it's another happy life, another happy day. And now we're talking to another. Shut up, Vince. <laughs> and now we're talking to another person that's at Vince's uh, birthday party. What do you think uh, that this day, Vince's birthday, means to you? That he's another year older. He's getting old. Now, I know Vince hangs out here a lot. I guess he's uh, pretty popular with the girls. Oh, they're all over him. I'm not lying, either. <laughs> and now we have another celebrant of the Vince's uh, birthday party. What does Vince's birthday mean to you, sir? It means that every time I set my damn hamburger down, he's stealing it. I found three of my hamburgers in his pocket already, and it's not pretty, and I'm hungry, and I can't even get one from over there. Well, let me ask you something, sir. Um, do you like to drink a lot? Um, that depends. If I'm drunk, usually, yes, I like to drink a lot. If How I'm much have you been drinking drunk, today? I'm on my second drink. That's all? Yeah, I hope to get another one. It looks like you've been drinking a lot more than that. Well, look. It looks like you've been drinking for days. Now, Margie, we'd like to ask you what Vince's birthday means to you. <laughs> no, I don't want to talk now. You're embarrassing. Guys. Now, Vince tells me that he's kind of like quite involved with you. Is that true? Wait, wait, wait. Give her a moment. Give her a minute. Let me. Baby. <laughs> Shut up, Vince. Here we are, continuing our. Don't tell me to shut up, Vince. This is really nice. It's a pleasant evening outside. And this is a beautiful garden. It has beautiful old trees in it. And we have Vince. Vince. The only thing I'm sorry about is that Vince didn't play his kibasa. Vince, where's the kibasa? Where but you know, he must have the harmonica. Can you tell me what Vince's birthday means to you? It means a whole hell of a lot. <laughs> Happy birthday, sweetheart. Here's another gentleman here, an oddball, who's going to tell us about what Vince's birthday means to him. Hey, good music, good times, good people, and good friends. What does Vince's birthday mean to you? I've never heard of him. Well, I'm happy we're celebrating Vince's birthday, aren't you, Marty? Yeah, um, I'll tell you what, It's he picked a great night to uh, an evening of enjoyment with Vince. You know, I know it might just be another day or another night or having a, having a beer watching this, but you know what? It's not. It's it's nothing like having a nice cool ice glass of tea and sitting back here in the uh, the beautiful patio back here in the garden of Molly's Bar and Grill in in the beautiful Soulard area. Okay, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out here on my birthday. It's a beautiful night. 
Uh, I've got all my nice friends with me here, and uh, I'd like to thank the Studebakers uh, for being on our show. Uh, they're th actually, I'm throwing this my birthday party for them because they've done it for me for years. Uh, they've uh, had a lot of people on uh, at their parties and stuff when they've been playing, and I'm just doing it for them. It's a courtesy for them, and uh, I wish them you know, a nice night tonight, and I'm having a great time. It's all like I'm with all my beautiful friends. Here's one of my good, close, personal friends, Sue. She's here with me tonight. I got Linda next to me over here. Uh, all I can say is I, I got Marty here. I, I got Pete here, and that's it. You know, <laughs> I mean, this is my birthday. That's all I can say. I'm having a great time. You know, people get very attached to their pets. And some people even believe that their pets will go to heaven. Of course, some people believe that they themselves will go to heaven. But that's another story. People pay money and have their pets buried in regular cemeteries, complete with tombstone and casket. our beloved lady, our Norwegian elk hound. We can give you a few minutes, sir. A sweetheart of a doggy. Real angel to us. Good friend, close companion. Our ladybug. Our beautiful Norwegian elk hound. We'll miss you so much, honey. Our good girl, our beautiful lady. A huge puppy dog, just as gentle as could be, just as sweet as she could be, a gentle giant, our ladybug. We love you so, lady. Old Shelby has gone.
gonna get her a nice statue. If you love your animal, no amount is too great to commemorate his life. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. You cry all the time. You ain't nothing but a hound dog. Cry all the time. Well, you ain't never caught a rabbit and you ain't no friend of mine. me 
here in, in St. Louis. Y'all hear me talking about Washington, but I don't, don't seem like I don't know but one street in St. Louis. <laughs> children in the children's ward of the hospital. I went there, and when I got there, there was two little babies in the crib pen plant. A little boy baby laid here, and a little girl baby laid here. All at once, I heard the little girl baby start to scream and hollering. Ah! Ah! Ray! Ray! The little boy baby looked at me and said, shut up and roll over. You're laying on your path of fire. Roosting in trees and all the ants wearing BBD. From the first to the last, I give them the blast so fast that their life is past before their ass has even hit the grass. See me uptown, downtown, crowned and renowned. Delayed, relayed, mislaid, and parlayed. Hatch, match, snatch, and scratch. Quack, jack, smack, quack. Boot black, blackjack, racetrack, and flapjack, and still coming back. If you crave satisfaction, this is the place to find that action. Coming to this theater as this next attraction oh. is the picture that will put you in traction. Dolomite, starring me, Rudy Ray Moore, as Dolomite. 
motherfucker caught me in the bed with his wife. Now he want to try to take my life. Go step on it and step on it quick. Burn some rubber because we're going to deal with that trick. Drive, nigga, drive, drive, nigga, drive. He think he's bad and ain't got no class. I'm going to wrap this shotgun up his motherfucking ass. Yeah, I'm the human tornado. I used an earthquake to mix my milkshake. I eat an avalanche when I want ice cream. I punched a hurricane and made it a breeze. I swallowed an iceberg and didn't freeze. I chained down thunder and handcuffed lightning. I'm so damn strong, it's sometimes frightening. I grabbed a star traveling a million miles a minute and slowed it down to the state speed limit. I may not be sleep, but women shriek when they see my physique. I got a dong as big as King Kong. The Human Tornado! Hey, Pete, you really mean you're going to go see Dolomite? Yeah, Rudy Raymore is my good friend. He calls me up a lot. We go hang out a lot. We, you know, spend a lot of time together. And I'm really uh, excited to see him back in St. Louis. <coughs> Rudy Ray, how nice What the f you want? You goddamn rat soup eating junk yard, no business bun, hunky mother. What you doing up here? Why you didn't it, call me pal. first? How you doing, pal? It's great to God see you. Damn. It's great to see you. Get baby. your big fat ass out of here. But wait, are we going to spend some time together? You should have called first. I didn't know you was bringing your ass up here. Oh, it should be my friends Marty and Angelo and Big Mike. Now you brought some more motherfuckers up here. Look at this big fat juicy butt motherfucker. God damn. And a man here with a goddamn camera. Mother get your ass out of here. Ain't that a wait, bitch? Wait, let me just come in for a while. Ned, don't bring your ass in here. Come on, let me in. Come on, I want to talk to you. Ass roaches and all in here. Get out of here. Get out of here.